see, we always start off our meeting um, uh, allowing the public to make uh, brief comments if they want. Does anybody here have something like to say? Yes, okay. I do. Got, got one up here. Go right ahead. Oh, actually, I'm sorry. Let me uh, ask one more. Well, I don't have to worry about it, Doug. Right here. <laughs> I'm just going to double make sure we had um, someone taking minutes and, and Doug is taking minutes. Doug is here? Yeah. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm hey. Adele Franks. And um, as I think many of you know, we uh, plan to now apply for a uh, U.S. Department of Energy grant to uh, expand the benefits of solar electricity to low and moderate income households as well as the nonprofits who up until now have not been able to really benefit from the, incentive, the solar incentives and so therefore have very little um, uptake of solar panels. Um, so we, uh, we formed a partnership with Co-op Power and Community Action and Brothers Out Front. We submitted a proposal and, um, and then last month we learned that we actually won an award. Um, they gave full funding to 35 community groups, including ours. <coughs> the funding is $50,000 seed grant plus $10,000 for technical assistance. And uh, then there are about 140 communities that got $10,000 technical assistance grants. So we felt really good about that. And we are now getting started on an ambitious 18-month project to um, <coughs> arrange for two and a half megawatts of solar uh, PV for low and moderate income households and nonprofits. And I'd love to talk to you more about it sometime. Uh, we're hoping that the city will be interested in partnering with us and perhaps converting some of these uh, par municipal parking lots into uh, solar arrays that could benefit uh, low and moderate income households after we manage to get the funding lined up for those things. So I have some handouts. It's basically a copy of a slide that we had to prepare for the, uh, it's called the Sunshot Program. And they wanted each team to prepare a slide. So that's the, this is the slide that we prepared. And our team is called Raise the Valley. And it is, uh, our reach is Hampton, I'm sorry, um, Hampshire and Franklin Campus. We look forward to your participation and interest in the project as it evolves. Adele, that was Ham uh, Hampton, Hampshire, and? No, I'm sorry, Hampshire and Franklin, two families. Okay, Hampshire and Franklin. Because okay. that's where Community Action has its reach. Okay. And they have access to 7,500 uh, low and middle uh, income families. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon. I'm Helen Armstrong. I'm a relatively newcomer in Northampton, and I live at 13 Buckingham Lane. Um, and I just want to say that I find the agenda for this meeting particularly exciting because I see that you're hearing very important things, and I want to wish you well. <laughs> Thank you. I think I can speak for all this to say welcome. <laughs> you have, uh, John Hampton? Um, anybody else? Okay. Um, all right. Uh, I would welcome a motion to approve the minutes of December 8th, 2016, and April 13th, 2017. I move them both, please. Okay. Okay. Uh, anybody have any discussions on the two minutes? No? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, any opposed? No? Any abstentions? One abstention. Who, who said this again? Um, uh, yeah. 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 Okay, last time we met, um, uh, we talked about the carbon fee and rebate resolution that went to city council, and I think everybody probably knows it's quite frankly on the agenda, so I can get it into the minutes. Um, that uh, that city council did pass that um, at their May 4th council meeting. Uh, uh, so 
So two votes, both votes were unanimous. Unanimously, both readings, yes. Carbon fee and rebate. Um, uh, ask, asking the state to um, pass a carbon fee and rebate bill for the law. And it was co-sponsored by um, the Energy Commission. Um, <coughs> so I don't know uh, if you, you folks may have also heard, and I just think this is interesting to add into it, that two days later, on May 6th, um, Shutesbury, Ashfield, and Plainfield all passed carbon fee and uh, dividend rebate um, resolutions as well. <coughs> um, so I've asked those, uh, I've asked, it's kind of a, an email um, uh, conversation happening online, and I've asked if someone would send me their resolutions just so we could kind of see them. I haven't gotten them yet, but if anybody does find any of those re resolutions, pass them my way. I live in Montague, and <laughs> we are looking at that now, too, so. Christian, you said there were three, Ashfield? Uh, Shootsbury, Ashfield, and Plainfield. Okay. Um, uh, we do have someone from Greenfield coming down, Carol Collins, who's the sustainability um, person in Greenfield coming down. I think she's going to be here about five, so. We can have a nice, relaxed conversation about the next <laughs> item. Um, but first, I will go for um, uh, the, the action item on here. Uh, so as you, as you know, we are implementing the, um, an outreach effort to um, increase the market share of air source heat pumps and to uh, encourage and help people to um, uh, take advantage of weatherization programs and increase the amount of weather weatherization um, uh, of their houses. Uh, and we're basing this outreach uh, program on the Solarize model, which relied on a, um, uh, a community volunteer to be a the coach or you know, kind of lead of a volunteer team uh, to do a lot of the work. Um, with the Solarize program, um, uh, they offered that um, the Solarize coach, a $500 stipend. And so I've asked the mayor if he would be willing to use some of the money from the Energy Revolving Fund uh, to pay a $600 stipend to whichever coach we find for this. And he's approved that. Um, but I would need to have the Energy Commission uh, approve that as well. So um, I'd like to move that uh, $600 from the Energy and Sustainability Revolving Fund be approved for uh, payment uh, um, just as a Encouraging stipend, they're going to do a lot more work than $600 is <laughs> uh, worth, but but um, uh, but you know, it, it's at least something for someone who's going to take on uh, the leadership of a volunteer team. I'll, I'll make that motion the, okay. uh, that we authorize this to $600 <coughs> to be applied to a stipend for a coach. Okay, and Louis just seconded. Um, Mr. Scott, yes. Um, how does the level of effort compare to the Solarize coach level of effort? I, I realize it's a small amount and it's just a stipend, but I, I'd like to think it scales accordingly. Like if it was going to require twice as much effort, maybe a thousand dollars stipend. Right. Well, I don't know if it's going to. I think it's going to be probably um, the. Um, you know, we're not demanding that they do certain things. It's, you know, largely with the Solarize program, it would work this way too. You know, the team kind of sets out what they want to do. And um, Solarize folks were really very active. So they did a lot. And the coach was instrumental in the success of they the were. program. Right, right. Yeah. Um, so I can't say exactly how much, but I would think the, just because of the time, you know, they probably couldn't do much more than the Solarize coach did. Um, oh, I see. Yeah. Right. Because you know, you, there's only so many events you can go to, so many ways you can organize. And they're not meeting with individual households. No. Solarize didn't either. No. Right. 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 The, the model of uh, purchasing and selling systems will be different, likely, right? Because that it was all be. that was bundled in under one installer. So right. there's probably a lot of effort choosing that installer, and then it was like they handle it. But right. There's right. a handful of smaller contractors that seems like a lot more education and coordination between those parties. Yeah, it could be. We are we are looking, we're most likely going to have a couple of contractors. It's, we've kind of been recommended that we look at a couple of contractors. As part of our request for qualifications, we are going to be asking them about their ability to handle outreach and marketing. Mm. 
because we would like the contractors to handle as much of it as possible. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Real Good Solar did that for the Solarize program. They, they actually took on a lot of um, uh, you know, tracking of names and contacts and stuff. Um, I wouldn't expect a volunteer team to do that. Yeah. Um, but you're right. You're right. And point taken, Scott. I mean, so you're, yeah. Just wanted to invite the conversation whether there was a, a reason or justification to tweak that number. I, I assume it was sort of cost of living adjustment to the last one. Yeah, for me, that's what, the, that's what it was, right? Right. Yeah, so it was a number of years ago, and I said, you know, so I just asked the mayor based on the Solar Rise program. Mm -hmm. Give them a performance bonus. <laughs> Maybe, you know. <laughs> um, uh, we'd have to, you know, get the mayor's approval for that too. Uh, Chris, do you, have, okay. do you have any candidates? Um, as I get through, I don't have a candidate for a coach, but I have. An, they're, they're, I'll, I'll get into it as I kind of report back on um, some groups of people I've been talking with, and I'm hoping someone is set forward. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, another term for coach would be a facilitator, someone who basically yeah. is a clearinghouse, a uh, person who is a clearinghouse and a liaison between you and the committee and, and the community at large and does the larger corralling, if you will, as opposed to. Right. Well, also, it kind of keeps track of the whole thing. Right. Right. Um, I think a lot of, you know, like Solarize, it was a team. Right. No, there were, I mean, you're right, there was there was a, a lot of enthusiasm to tap into there. So right. Right. matter of fact, well, we have one of the team members here. There we go. <laughs> okay. So I, I expect the enthusiasm to be equivalent and hopefully address some of Scott's concerns there. I mean it's it's I think the community's awareness of solar was much higher and more acute than it was in its relative to air source heat pumps. That's true. Um, so maybe it's a bit of a heavier lift. Right. So. Right. And I would I would hope that the uh, outreach for the air source heat pumps is a, you know is highly highly successful. And and yet I think um, at a minimum, uh, you, you know there are four other communities doing this: Boston, Somerville, Providence, Rhode Island, and Portland, Maine. And Boston and Somerville, the Boston's actually gotten a little uh, bogged down because of some RFQ problems. Somerville's probably the strongest. Portland, I'm really kind of unclear on what they're doing. And Providence, I really think, is probably just trying to rate, raise the name recognition of their season for our pumps. So if this program actually just succeeds in raising people's awareness that there's this clean energy option out there, you know, I think it's going to consider a success. Well, the other thing so, is they they have an advantage of being able to springboard off the ground that's already been plowed by the, the solar eyes. That's true. That's right. And because um, it's a great companion piece mm -hmm. for people with the solar system. I already have a built-in um, email base, I would imagine, or contact base. And that, mm -hmm. It's a great way to start to build on you know, something. I mean, as I said, that field's been plowed. There's a reason yeah. to, to expect it. And not only that, the connections made with different organizations throughout the town, uh, the whole outreach and marketing plan, what they did in the past, you know, can we all be looked at and just uh, tweaked and, and, and gone go from there. So, yeah. The, the uh, natural gas connection moratorium in Northampton is certainly pushing the uh, air source heat pump installations a lot because right. it's, you know, it's the second, you know, air source heat pumps are, are, are more expensive than the high efficiency gas, but they're certainly the second alternative, um, especially when you're looking at HERS ratings, you know, for, for new construction. Um, right. And they're the cleaner alternative. Natural um, <coughs> gas has no renewable energy in it. Air source heat pumps, right now, the renewable portfolio standard has a set one. I, I, I think it's a 15% uh, renewable. So I don't, we purchase 17% renewable at the moment. Uh, and that's going to continue going up every year. So that's that, at least that much is, is powering your, your heating system. So it, you know, it's got renewable energy in there. Well, um, according to Columbia Gas, the moratorium is yes. as an endpoint. Right. So we'll see. That. <laughs> and we shall see. I actually think that's all the more reason to have this program launch now. <laughs> yes. Let people know there's another opportunity. 
Any further discussion on the stipend? I actually am going to bring up a bit more on this. I'm going to give you a status and talk about this even more. All in favor? And all of, anybody opposed? Scott. Okay. Not opposed, just uh, wondered if we ought to go to, did you say you were taking this to the mayor for approval? Huh? He's so, already he's already approved it. Okay. Yeah. Are you kind of suggesting that I might go back to him and I'm suggesting? I'm wondering if, if the, uh, we could pass it with a cap and to be determined at final, final setup. But I'm totally fine with the amount okay. that's proposed to. Okay. So is that a yes? That's a yes. That's a yes. Okay. Um, I believe I will probably be going back to the mayor uh, uh, and, and the commission for some other funds, um, I, uh, just for marketing material. Um, uh, I didn't at the moment because I want to give an opportunity for the installers to come forward with some funds to, uh, to cover, you know, printing and copying and signs and stuff like that. Um, uh, but, uh, who knows, we might have an opportunity to raise this amount again or, or look at it again. Yeah. Um, all right, so um, uh, a status of this, of the outreach planning. Um, uh, so I'm forming a planning team. Uh, it's coming along pretty well. Just to let folks know, and uh, I think you know how his last name is pronounced. I think I always feel Ben Wheel. Wild. Wild. It's wild. Okay. I always, I'm never quite sure. So Ben Wild, professor of building science at UMass, is very excited <coughs> to be on the um, planning team for this this event. He's very very knowledgeable about uh, just where air source safety pumps could be used, uh, economics of them, uh, uh, you know, uh, the ins and the pros and cons of doing a whole house system versus a uh, supplemental system, um, he is, it's great to have him on. Peter Wingate from Community Action, uh, the energy director, he is going to be on here. They've been putting air source heat pumps in in low uh, income eligible households already. Um, uh, River Strong uh, with the UMass Clean Energy Extension uh, and Director Dwayne Greger is also highly interested in this, but River will be the one sitting on the planning um, committee helping bring uh, more stuff from UMass to this, including the student outreach team. I mean, they might actually be able to get students to help with the volunteer outreach and stuff. Um, Gary Miku from the Meister um, Consultants Group, uh, they're the paid consultants for the uh, renewable thermal outreach piece. They've been very helpful all along. Uh, uh, the Meister Group has done a lot of studies on air source heat pumps. Um, uh, they've been involved in a, a program up in upstate New York. Uh, they, they're just very, very knowledgeable about this whole thing, so uh, it's great to have them involved. Um, I'm going to have someone from the Grinspoon Foundation at least sit in uh, and stay informed on it. Um, I'm not sure if it's quite appropriate to have it, but anyhow, they'll, they'll be there because we're going to hopefully be using their infrared images um, um, and more to come on that later on. Um, and then I have invited um, Max uh, Zaranti from uh, Center for Ecotechnology, he's a home energy raider. Uh, he might not be able to, you know, to have enough um, time for this. Uh, I do want to keep Center for Ecotechnology informed um, because they just do so much work in the outreach uh, around energy efficiency and stuff that if there are any opportunities for us to partner, um, I'd like that to be um, available. Um, and then um, I have invited, uh, and once again, I'm not sure if you'll have enough time, uh, Patrick Bohan. He's on the Northampton Housing Partnership Board. Um, and he had approached me because of the Housing Partnership Board's um, uh, uh, strong interest in increasing the efficiency level of homes that are just above that income eligible level. So um, uh, I'm not sure exactly how we can. <coughs> but he's got connections and can help us identify ways to help those homeowners access air source heat pumps and weatherization, then I'd like this effort to be able to partner with him in, in approaching those homeowners. Um, uh, yeah, so I'm, um, I'm aiming to have an outline and a schedule of uh, planning team meetings um, available for everybody uh, by next week. Um, and hopefully I have a kickoff meeting uh, this month. 
Um, are commissioners, any commissioners interested in kind of um, me touching, you know, Pat sending out that planning team that, that the guidance and outline? If you are, just let me know and I can keep you in the loop. Um, I'd be happy to be on as well. Oh, very good. Aiden, you just volunteered. Yeah. All right. We have one more. Um, okay. Um, I know I had, uh, had discussed the planning team with the Energy Commission in the past because of you know the need for policy or privacy privacy decisions. You know, um, Alicia, you brought this up last time. You know, who's going to be making kind of policy decisions around privacy and stuff here? And I've spoken with the mayor, and I'm going to be passing things by the mayor's office, keeping him uh, quite informed. Uh, so we have someone who represents the whole uh, whole city um, uh, helping out with that. Um, I have a working title, and it's probably going to stay, but I'll pass it out to see what people think. Heat Smart Northampton. Um, I'm using this title. Okay, I'm seeing that's not, that's nice. Uh, anybody, I should mail it out there. It's not, <laughs> no, Heat Smart Northampton. Um, uh, I'm using this title uh, because the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center expects to roll out a renewable thermal solarized type program next winter or next summer. Um, we're ahead of the game. They're already asking us, you know, to, can, can we learn from you guys? So that's wonderful. They're going to call it Heat Smart. There's a very successful program in Tompkins County, New York. That's called Heat Smart Tompkins County. It's starting to get to be kind of the Heat Smart becoming the solarized term that people are using all around. So um, since I didn't see anybody kind of jump up and say, ooh, yeah, it's getting firmer and firmer the more I look at this Heat Smart. <laughs> Yeah, okay, people are, okay. <laughs> I really, I, I mean, I want to know how the community is going to take it, and yeah. That's great. Yeah, not as good as Raise the Valley, but it's pretty good. Oh, <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> He's smart, Raise the Valley. Uh, <laughs> um, okay. Did you say there's another program coming up next winter by the same name? Uh, so the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center, they're the ones that sponsor the Solarize programs. Oh. Um, and when we when we did it, they are the ones that actually went out and procured the contractors, and then we selected a contractor. Over time, they started letting communities procure their own contractors, but they're the ones that kind of helped get a whole community set up to do it. And provided just a, they're the ones that provided the stipends, a little bit of marketing money, and stuff like that. Um, and they've been running solarized programs uh, across Massachusetts for a while, for a number of years. Um, and they are now looking at doing one for renewable thermal, uh, largely air source heat pumps. Um, so yes, it's a, I guess I'm wondering, will this cause confusion with that one? Um, I don't think so. Um, I mean, when the Solarize program started, they started with a pilot that was in three small communities, and then it changed drastically after the pilot and got larger, and that's when we got involved. Connecticut's done a Solarize program, uh, you know, but it, so, the Solarize brand is kind of the general, people know it's got a couple different components. It's short term, you know, it's got a limited time. Um, it has volunteer outreach efforts, so volunteer teams uh, doing, doing the effort. And it has some kind of discount uh, with tiered pricing uh, of some kind. So our program is going to try to be doing all, all the same thing, their source heat pumps. Um, uh, you know, I don't know the market for tiered pricing yet, but uh, we'll see once we put on an RFQ and, and try to get it, but we are certainly going to try to get a, some kind of a tier pricing or a reduced pricing for air source heat pumps. We're going to have a volunteer team, and it's around renewable thermal. So I think the brand is kind of being set, and, um, uh, and Mass Cleanery Center has no problem with us using the name. Um, uh, that, so I think it's just going to become a new kind of a loose brand that people can use, Heat Smart, is that kind of this kind of a program. Yeah. And they're just going to be providing state support to get other communities to do this. If I had known about this before we went to this effort ourselves, you know, maybe I would have waited for that. But here we are. <laughs> We're ahead of the game. Um, okay, um, as far as volunteers, I have met with um, actually a number of them are here. Um, I have met with the 100% Renewable Energy Working Group from Climate Action Now, um, 
to, to basically talk about a lot of different city clean energy initiatives um, and what's happening with the city. But I also uh, basically pose this project as as a um, uh, as a, as something that they may take on as a volunteer team. And um, I find it really fun that the 100% renewable energy campaign has uh, Mass Power Forward put out a guide for 100% renewable energy teams. And they have a whole bunch of steps that towns can do. And then they, they list you as a beginning town, an intermediate town, or advanced town, depending on how many of those steps you've done. Northampton is definitely <coughs> at the advanced town level. And then they give some additional things that it, these different level towns might do. And on the advanced town level, one of them is do a heat smart type program on renewable thermal. So, um, so it kind of goes right along with what the whole 100% renewable uh, energy program is working on. And that group is now considering this. And that's one reason I definitely want to, I want to get, um, I don't know if you guys know, um, I'm putting together kind of a, uh, a marketing plan outreach document, a draft um, that I'm going to be sending out to you. Um, hopefully by tomorrow, Monday at the latest. So you have a little bit more concrete idea of what it's all going to entail. And uh, just to let you know, what I send you is not something you have to do. It's a, you might call it a guide, or you know, it's based on what we did in the Solarize, and it could be added to, subtracted from, tweaked. Um, but um, but I will send it to you because it gives you a little more concrete idea of what uh, of what has to, what's going to be done. Right? Okay. Um, and then I will be presenting to Mothers Out Front on May 21st, who have also expressed an interest on um, this with concept to, to, uh, to help uh, form a volunteer outreach team. So you guys might be partnering with Mothers Out Front, I don't know. Um, I, I don't know. I'm, you know I, I don't know what their responses are going to be yet, but um, there's a lot of interest. And I have to say, ever since the election, there has been a lot of people stepping forward to help out. <laughs> it's heartwarming. Um, all right. Request for qualifications. Um, uh, uh, it's no, next thing we have to do is uh, actually get some contractors on board. Um, and the Meister Group is developing an RFQ for Somerville in Boston. Um, Boston is basically pulled back at the moment because of some internal problems with what the RFQ is doing. Somerville is moving forward. We've already reviewed that RFQ. Um, and as soon as it gets to be a little bit more finalized, uh, Meister is going to edit it for Northampton and take into account the concerns that our procurement officer has raised. And so hopefully, um, uh, by the beginning of June, we'll have an RFQ out um, uh, looking for a request for qualification for contractors, um, uh, timing wise. What, um, yeah. what were those concerns that, they, uh, that Joe raised? Uh, don't remember them. They were easy. They were easy to address. Okay. They were they were good points, really good points, um, but easy to address. Um, I don't remember. I can send them to you though if you want. Okay, I'm I'm yeah. just curious. I mean, as long as I, right. I, I trust Joe implicitly, so I think that I, I, he's assiduous about this stuff. So I have no problem with that. I, so as long as they're not massive, they're massive problems, and that no. they're easily corrected. Right. There were just things like, yeah, you should should look at it that way. You know, you should have this guarantee in there or or, right. or something. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, actually, I, I do remember what the reason. I, it did come back to me. The reason Boston um, was hesitating uh, was <coughs> um, a concern that if Boston selected an installer and the installer put something in and it went south on someone. That they it was would liability. Pay, they would pay, right. Um, but Joe had actually, even before we heard Boston was back now, Joe had already kind of tagged that and he'd come up with a solution. Um, you know, he's basically saying the contractors, in, in their contracts with anybody that they work with, there should be a clause in their contract. We require them to have a clause that basically um, uh, says that you know, the city is not responsible for it. They, you know, they should also be bonded. So, oh yeah, I'm yeah. sure Joe will want them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's probably you know the biggest thing because that's kind of stopped Boston. It hasn't stopped Somerville. And I don't think and Joe didn't raise that large of a. I mean he had a solution for it that he would have been happy with. So. Okay. 
Yeah. How is it different than the Solar Ice Northamptons? I mean, if something went wrong there, how is that? You know, I don't know if, um, uh, we didn't raise that issue with, with Solar Ice because the state did the procurements. So we didn't have to worry about it. Even though, you know, we, it was, you know, being promoted by Northampton. Um, right. Oh, I actually, I tell Louis how to do that. But is there any kind of a, a technical aspect of the RFQ? Like, are we talking about a specific kind of, um, you know, the mini splits? Because you know, the heat pump is one thing, but what you do with what the heat pump generates is, you know, can be pretty diverse. Uh, and I wondered if we're going in a specific direction. Are we looking at certain kinds of systems? Are we looking at you know, any sort of categories, uh, cost levels? Um, uh, that is definitely, uh, as far as what outreach uh, happens, that is gonna be something that the planning team kind of struggles with, partly by the data that we get. To say, you know, what's possible in, in, in town. I suspect that uh, supplemental systems are gonna be most likely went out. Um, uh, you know, it's, a, it's kind of a big thing to replace your whole system uh, with an air source heat pump. Um, and so there probably would be limited opportunities for there. So I think the supplemental mini splits are, are probably going to be the most likely. Um, they are, um, the RFQ does spell out qualifications. Um, I don't have them on the top of my head. And really, I would be glad, love to have you actually reviewing. <laughs> Just uh, you know, involved in, in reviewing the RFQ. It's, it's probably aligned with the Mass Community Center Rebate Program, which is just the highest efficiency, best Japanese stuff. So it's the highest year, the highest uh, HSPF, because and that's all they'll give at six to, now it's up to $1,200 per yeah. compressor. So I think the pro I, I, that would be my recommendation is you just follow what's eligible for those rebates. Yes, and we are probably going to follow um, uh, probably have to, any contractor will have to have been approved by the Mass Clean Energy Center as well. And they do have an approved list, which isn't a really hard list. It's, it's not. It's not a really hard thing to get approved, mm -hmm. um, but they do have a list of that, and there's a whole slew of them in Hampshire County. So, um, uh, so we have plenty to choose from. Yeah. Yeah. They really want to steer it towards the more economical systems. I mean, I think that a air source heat pump system could be, you know. Aside from the ground source heat pump, could be the most expensive heating system you could choose. I mean, you could get seriously fancy about. Oh, expensive! You need to install. Right. Right. Okay. Not to operate, but to. Um, yeah. Depends on. Yeah, I guess it depends on how you do it, but but yeah, I I try to guide it towards simpler systems that and uh, you know, look towards retrofit as opposed to you know look at new construction. Yeah, I'm pretty sure you know, we're going to be looking at retrofits, very, very much so. Right? Yeah, it's different from PV or even other heating systems where you'll get three different design proposals from three different contractors for the same house for the same problem, so the same solution. Um, so I, should, I think there should be some kind of review process of the proposals. It will be. Um, I'm uh, I'm going to have the planning team. Uh, as part of that review process, mm -hmm. and possibly some city staff that we need. Um, uh, if you're going to be on the planning team, Aiden, you'll, you'll be there, right? Yep. So the RFQ, um, uh, you know, the request for qualifications um, will have to include a pricing structure um, in there as well, so that um, we, can, we can see that. But I, I'm, I'm letting Meister Group kind of pull together the RFQ and then we'll review it uh, before it gets published. Um, and if I think I have any questions along this line, I'll be glad to pass it by you guys. Oh, at least, um, I'm sorry. It, well, I, sorry, I was just curious, maybe more about time frame. Well, a couple of kind of multifaceted question, but you mentioned before that, you know, ideally maybe the installers would be the ones that would want to do their own marketing, but we would supplement that potentially. But I was just curious about the time frame. If the RFP is not going to be fully ready to go, or the RFQ is not going to be ready to go until June, and then if we're looking to roll out at what time, and then the state program is starting in the, the winter, I'm just curious about all that. When, when the state program is going to roll out, what that means, um, it, it wouldn't happen in Northampton, anyhow. Um, uh, that means they're going to put out an um, uh, application process for people, which then will take you know six months to go through before they even give it, give it out to anybody. 
And I know that when they first start, they're going to once again do like one, two, three pilot communities. So it's going to be very sparse. Um, and it, I can't see them having a, a program on the ground running until at the earliest next summer. Um, as far as our timing, um, I would love to have this up and running by July. Um, by, by, I think we can do that, but it might be mid-July. And run through um, October, if we have to, like we did with the Solar Rights Program, push it out another month, um, you know, November or so, is what I, is, is the time frame I'm aiming for. It's tight, but we can do it, yeah. Can you just go through, you know, when you're done with your thought, just go through the program design, like as you're thinking of it, like how's this, how's a customer even experience this, tying in the energy efficiency, massive audit, and the okay. um, infrared scan? And sure, the way, the way I'm envisioning it happening uh, is it's gonna be based on the installers doing workshops. Um, that, uh, so, um, and so, you know, the Solarize had the Solarize 101 and Solarize 202, or whatever it was, 201. <coughs> um, this is going to probably have to have some fairly regular workshops throughout the throughout the season. Um, um, I'm envisioning people signing up for them, and um, where you get introduced to it, the installers will be there, so you could then make that contact and connect with the installer. And um, the vision I have, and this actually gets to one of the more fun things I'm about to bring up, is that uh, you know if you're pre-registered, then you get your infrared image at that workshop. And we have some high performance contractors there as well. Someone that can help you kind of look at the image and say, what can you do with this? Um, we'll also have information on your energy enter score. So, you know, what was our, what was, what do we think your building is? You know, and how do you think you might be able to improve it? Um, and that's where I could easily see uh, CET or someone else with the Mass Save program being there to be able to sell, say to people, here's some of the, the assistance you can have. So it's gonna, the way I'm picturing it is it's gonna really be worked around these workshops that people really deeply get in, uh, connected to it. If possible, through these workshops, we can connect up people who have like problems, you know, people with capes, people with split levels, who with the same age house, they have the same kind of insulation issues. You know, if we can kind of get them to meet each other and possibly work with one contractor, um, you know, that's, you know, there might be ways of actually reducing costs through certain effort for those people. So that's it, right, that, that's kind of my vision of it. Did Solaris have a free site visit where the where the PV contractor came out and looked at orientation and viability? Yes. Yeah. Is is that is there going to be that concept? Is that written to the RQ or? I think it would have to. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it's on the installer, not the uh, energy auditor. Likely. Yeah. I, yes. I would think. I mean, because an energy auditor could go out there and make a suggestion, but an installer yeah. will come in and just give you a whole new idea. Right. So, right. Yeah. All the rebates are predicated on a mass save audit yes. ahead of time. So right. there's going to be, the, you know, at least always that. That's right. 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 Throw away thousands of dollars. I wonder if mass save will give a buy. If, if one of these program approved installers is going in to do an assessment of um, heat pump viability, maybe they'll say, okay, for that specific using heat pump for that specific thing, you can, you're okay. Mass save will say, um, if, you know, if you want to get the audits, you've got to do X, Y, Z, A, B, C. I mean, it's not burdensome necessarily, but they'll lay down some some actions that that don't cost a lot. Like, right. uh, you need you want to get an air sealer in here, you're gonna have to change all your light bulbs. Right. You need to put in water saving shower heads before we'll, uh, sign off on this piece. Right. They look at the existing heating systems. You know, mm -hmm. But that could take months. Like that. The, I mean, all that stuff is great and free or low cost, but it's just the scheduling and the wait. So if you have someone that calls my save in September, they might not get there until January. Like, literally. Huh. So like the Solar Rights Program, this time period that I spelled out is really the marketing and outreach time period. It's not the installation right. time period. That's when you're signing a contract to work with these guys. And like the Solarize program, the Solarize program, I think within a year we had all the PV arrays put so in. So could the like, contractor going to go, okay, now get your mass save audit and they've even signed up through the right. program and that can happen when it happens, right. knowing that you'll get people approval at the end of it. Right, right, right. And I'm sure there'll be some attrition 
you know, contracts are signed that they end up saying, you know, you know, the mass safe auditor found something and we can't move forward with it, but, um, but we'll find out. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Good to get Meisters kind of, if they can work anything in the back channel, easing the process through mass save. Yes. That'd be good. Um, yeah, and coordinate with mass save. And I'm hoping to have people actually go beyond mass save, of course. Right, right. And I know personally, I would like to actually require that someone not only had a mass save audit, Louie, you're actually kind of alluding to this right now. I don't want people to just have a mass save audit. I want them to have done something. <laughs> you know, the solar right program, you had to have an audit. Right. You didn't have to do anything to improve your house. You just had to have an audit. Um, uh, you were just kind of implying that someone's going to require at least a nominal amount of work. That well, mass, mass save has purse strings. I mean, that's their, what they yeah. have that, that probably is the most, that, that's their influence. And, and what they'll require is, is, is usually minimal. Um, but, you know, I mean. Require um, approve. Approve for, for what? Purpose? In order to approve, in order to approve, uh, you know, the rebates for a water heater or for a heating system, um, they have like a laundry, a checklist. Okay. And, and I don't know how, I don't, I don't have a lot of experience with older houses, so I don't know how far down the checklist they push you before they're willing to give you a piece of paper that you can turn in along with the receipt for the um, for the new heating system to get their rebates. Okay. I have, I have a pretty good gotcha. idea on how it works. Okay. So right, so like I think we're, what you're saying is like they'll give you a contract for weatherization measures and you have to do what they say or make the case for something else if you're gonna go outside of the program or something different. But pretty much the mechanical equipment, if they check off, you know, your furnace is older than nineteen eighty nine or whatever the threshold is, you know, then you're okay you know, here's your heat loan paperwork, you can go ahead and get the rebates. Whether or not you do air seal. Yeah, the recommend. mechanical stuff is kind of separate from the weatherization measures and it might be, except for um, the roadblocks, the knob and tube wiring, they may require you before you do any heat loan to take care of that stuff, the asbestos knob and wiring, if they flag that. I don't know, it's a big, big question. But from my experience, I think the mechanical system incentives are all kind of, if you qualify, you're good to go. Okay, to be worked out. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, uh, but that's the basic, uh, the basic kind of plan that, that I see it rolling out. Um, all right. Here's the good. Here's the fun news. Um, within two days of our last meeting, when um, folks from um, the Grinspoon Foundation were here, I got a notice that um, the Grinspoon Foundation is asking SS, ESS, ESS, the folks that actually do the IR imaging and processing all the data. They are asking them if Northampton could have 100% of the data processed. So not the lowest 20%. They're asking and want to be able to provide us with IR images for the whole way for cool. everybody. That's great. The yeah. entire inventory. Yeah, the entire inventory. One so for family. So I think it just shows they're kind of excited about what we're going to do with, with, with this stuff. So that hasn't been approved yet, um, but the request has gone in and we should be hearing soon. Yeah, that's very fun news. Which then makes the model I just spelled out actually viable. Because right, if not, it would, yeah. right, right. I actually did go back to them and said, well, could you turn around processing an image uh, quickly if I just had just the people who show up for workshops? And they said, no, I can't do that. It's, you know, gonna, they're going to batch it. So um, uh, they're going to either do it all or the 20%, then we'll find out. Um, you mentioned they have a mailing situation over part of their services mailing to people directly. That's their model. That's what they first came out with. Okay. Is that they wanted, and you know, my. But you could like store them in someone's like tax file and just if they don't come to the workshop, just send it with their. They're going to be. Uh, they're going to store the data on their own website. And the city will have access to view that, but we won't be able to download. So, um, and the reason why is we don't want to ever own, we don't want to own, the, own that data publicly. Uh, so we can use it for planning purposes, um, but we can't, if we won't own it, that means someone can't come in and say, I want all this data. Um, Public record, right? Yeah. I, I think you should also specify use, that we, that it could only be used 
as an analytic for right. an analysis of, of, of uh, heat loss as opposed to, as I said, right. um, you know, right. marijuana. investigation, marijuana, whatever, anything right. else, uh, you know, public shaming, access to private information, blah, blah, blah. Right, right. Um, uh, I, I will talk to the Grizzly Foundation about that, yes. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to do that because that's all I, I want this for is to help. Right, them. I mean, we're limiting our access terms right. that, so to right. protect privacy, so that. Right. Okay, that, thank you, that's a good point, yeah. Um, uh, I think I mentioned this before, but it kind of ties in with this, so um, we also have a, a UNH fellow um, uh, that will be started on June 5th uh, with GIS expertise to help us mapping all these programs. And, um, so, you know, we're gonna have, they're, so basically we'll, we'll have someone available to help the team identify and try to come up with um, uh, subgroups to target and how to, how to reach out to them. Um, and um, because of the connection with the Clean Energy Center or Clean Energy Extension, um, uh, just had uh, a UMass student who, who was doing a GAS class and she needed a project. And we gave her a project and that was to uh, actually map the underscore stuff. So I've got six copies here. <laughs> Just enough for everybody to kind of two people to look at it each. Um, just to give you an idea, this is the, so she, she needed to come up with a display for a final pass project. This is the display. Um, we've got the underlying data. I have no way of seeing it with GIS because we had some GIS personnel leave and we haven't got some new in yet. But uh, when June 5th comes around, um, we'll have to put this in. And I, I pass this around just for your, your interest and stuff. There's another one. And as you recall, we've had conversations, and Wayne, I guess you looked up your inner score at one point and was kind of surprised to see that you only got a C plus. Yeah. Right? Or your lead certified house. If you look on the back side, it, it kind of shows um, how inner scores uh, scores actually um, relate to the hers rating and stuff. And so I think it's totally wonderful, you know. It, we have no A pluses um, in Northampton, I've noticed. And the reason why is we don't have any house that's producing more energy than it uses. Um, an A is a net zero. Um, and so, you know, you're, I think it, that, that's what we aim for, folks. You know, we're aiming for houses that don't use. There's only one net zero. zero house. There's only one net zero house? Well, this is based on public data. Um, and there may be errors in the database, and it probably doesn't include the last year's construction. The Mary Square did their work about a year ago. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Ten minutes left, and uh, Carol has just gotten here. Hi, Carol. Hi. Come on in. We're going to wrap up one more item, um, and then. Uh, Chris, I have one more uh, common question about this. Sure. It's kind of just an idea, but in your the workshops you mentioned grouping people together. Would Interscore be interested in being involved in using their categories in that way? And coming and saying, look, here's uh, here, you know, go over here if you're in this category, and then, then giving a presentation about what the assumptions or findings are? I could ask them. We're going to use their um, uh, their the data they gave us and how they divided the houses up, we're going to use that as, as you know, try to find those. So we've got that data. Um, this person at UMass wasn't able to put that much, that amount of detail into her project. They have like 13 different yeah, housing types different. and yeah. there's just three. Right. Okay. Exactly. Yeah, that broke it down. The different housing types they had were all in those three time categories. Mm -hmm. So that's the most detail with this for a class project, what she could do. Sure. Um, but the UNH uh, fellow um, well, an idea. Yeah. is absolutely going to dive into their building types that cool. Interscore came up with. Um, that's a lot, of you, a lot of what she's going to be doing. So looking at that, looking at demographics, looking at geographic information, and trying to come up with it. Um, OK. Yeah, actually, I think I'm no, I didn't. So I don't know, did anybody get a chance to look at the survey I sent out late? today. Um, and Scott um, actually sent back a couple comments. 
I'd love to have your feedback on this. Um, and, you know, with the Solarize program, one of the first things we did, we put out a survey of the communities through SurveyMonkey to ask the community for their interest. I think we had four or five questions, really simple, very easy to fill out. And we had 600 people respond, or 600, over 600 people. So that gave us an enormous leg up on, on outreach, because we had, you know, over 600 people show in some kind of interest. And they have to enter their email, right? As part of it. They didn't have to. Okay. They didn't have to. It was an option. Right. But a lot of people did. Yeah, um, uh, yeah I think we ended up having like 500 people that we had, uh, you know, four or 500 people that Great we had to contact. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, but we didn't want to limit it by requiring them to give an email. So, so um, in this case, I started doing it and I said, well, this this question or that question. I passed it by a Meister group and someone there said, well, you might want to add these questions in and stuff. So that's what I sent off to you. And you know, in five minutes, um, let me know. Chew it. Limit it to a certain number of questions. Um, Scott, you gave me some great feedback already. I had a couple of thoughts. Sure. Um, one is to up top somewhere in the introduction um, include kind of the economic pitch here. You know, an average cost of a ductless ASHP is twenty, you know, three thousand dollars or twenty-seven dollars. Current rebates are, you know, for the highest high efficiency systems. Of course, it's all income eligible and stuff, but it is approximately twelve hundred dollars. Okay. You know, and that alone just shows there's, you know, high. Or maybe through this program, we expect to, you know, to provide an incentive totaling twelve hundred dollars. So it's not just Mass A Planning Center, but whatever else the the buy the the bulk pricing, the reduced pricing, mm -hmm. kind of just making an estimate. That you know, this is just really high value and putting it up there because you know, you have some people that wrap their brains around this new technology, which is kind of tied to another suggestion. I have is like having a photo of what these are that people might recognize what they look like, but not um, the um, air suppressor heat pump technology name. Um, anyway, you're, you're asking people to wrap their mind around a lot, and yeah. just to show this is actually a really high value thing right off the bat because the rebates are pretty amazing. I mean, it's 30% up to 50% if you meet the, the income requirements. Okay, great, thanks. Yeah, I mean, basically in the industry, this is called a push survey, basically. You're not, <laughs> you're not trying to get people's opinion. You actually want to pique their opinion. interest and get them engaged, and Aiden's absolutely right. I think a preamble that actually uh, defines what benefits and pluses are would this interest you. You know, is, is is this sexy enough to appeal to you? That's that's essentially what we want to be a driver, as opposed to just just trying, you know, in, you know, in a very passive way, determine what people's opinions are. Okay, so. right, right. In the solar we didn't have to worry about it. Right, right. Was well, as, as as Aiden pointed out, and as we said before, that people's awareness of these systems is not as it's not as approachable as a solar panel. A panel sits on your roof and you electricity generated that's a pretty simple step um, air source heat pumps heat pumps in general are kind of a mystery for a lot of folks mm -hmm. I mean the what it pumps heat from where to what and right. how it's what your refrigerator. It's temperature? just like your refrigerator yeah, like it's reverse well that, that doesn't clear up anything yeah. for most <laughs> folks. I mean, you know, just like your refrigerator it works like magic that's all I know <laughs> airplanes don't fall out of the sky that's good too but not, none of it makes sense to me I don't understand so I think something with clear terms no acronyms uh, simple accessible uh, data information and Price benefit, all all included in the first paragraph. And is this going to be distributed via email? Yeah, it'll be a, like a survey monkey, and the link will go out. Um, I mean, last time we did this by providing the link to a whole bunch of different partners who are willing to share it with their listservs and stuff. You can also do you it know. through social media. Yeah, it'll be it'll be a lot through social media, uh, media neighborhood groups, social media, the city website, city websites. But I'm just um, thinking the kind of promotional material we're talking about shouldn't go inside the survey. It should go in the cover page to the survey to get people okay. to click into the survey. Okay. Okay. Because yep. if they don't know what an air source heat pump is, they won't go to a survey about it until they're told. So, mm -hmm. right. Okay. So that introduction at first, right? The two paragraphs should be the cover page. Right. Yeah, that so actually might yeah. might be better because the survey itself is going to look simpler. 
That's right. Right. And you want them to go, I mean, I'm, I'm really thinking you, you're going to want to get the survey and say, oh, yeah, I can do this. The survey, yeah. honestly, if it doesn't fit on the page, right. we're all suffering from survey burnout. <laughs> I mean, that's one of the things you include. Okay, survey so will take you no longer than right. 10, 15 yeah. minutes or something. Like that, right? I think it's important to ask, to ask <laughs> us what, <laughs> like, what, what's, what's so our so goal so for so this? So like, so what so are we so trying good. to get? And, and people's yeah. emails is probably one of the main, you know, you're trying to gauge interest, but really, yeah. if you package this right, anybody who's viable for it should be interested in it at least. Right. I guess there's really, there's really three goals. One is, you know, uh, raise awareness. Um, uh, judge interest, um, uh, actually, so judge interest, cap capture names, but yeah, so yeah, great, right, cap capture some contact information. So the follow, follow up with up, more detail. Right, follow up, right, you know, um, uh, raise awareness out there, and then raise awareness of the program. You know, basically, it's kind of to start creating the buzz, mm -hmm. to let people know that this is, this is coming. Um, that, and that's what the survey did with the civil rights program. Um, you know, people, before we even applied, in that case, we were applied for a grant, so before we even applied, we had 600 people who knew about it who were saying, yes, I'm interested. That was pretty phenomenal. I um, agree with yeah. what has been said, and I also think that it might be useful in that kind of opening thing to have maybe some FAQs, just some really, uh, really quick, clear, concise kind of um, pieces of information about what these are because I, I, I think it's really true what these guys are saying that I think this is a whole new technology to people. A lot of people don't even know the term before they even open something like this. The other thing that I just want to bring up and I know that there's not an easy solution to this is the same thing that we talked about last um, meeting that the people who are least likely to take advantage of something like this are the people that probably need it the most in terms of the savings that it provides. And so, and I know this is a conversation that Mass Save has all the time. You know, how do you, is there some way we can create some kind of, um, you know, ambassador or person who actually can help people who may be more in need of this kind of thing than others who might not be as sophisticated, um, you know, have the, the level of sophisticated knowledge necessary to understand that this is even something they could consider. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering if the working group, when you come together, mm -hmm. you can talk about that and really think about that and think about what can be put in place to really kind of accompany people through this process who could really benefit from it that might not be able to navigate all these words and all the, the, the concepts. Okay, right. I mean, it, it, this, this type of outreach actually lends itself to it because you're not using just normal mass marketing. You're using neighborhood connections. Well, I would also, I would, I would also but, to uh, at least But I, I, don't, I hear what you're saying. I, I would contact the CAC, uh, Community Action. Yeah, Peter Wingate, on a, he's the Community Action of Franklin County. And they do outreach for low-income houses that might not have access otherwise to the information or, or, or even the prospect of thinking that they could afford it. And they can do the outreach because they do, uh, they do fuel assistance, they do uh, right. the, the air, source know, protection, the air source heat pumps. Right. I, it seems to me that that um, is exactly, it's the population that, that Elisa is absolutely correct in, in being concerned about because frequently these upgrades are usually only considered by people who even think that they have the upfront money that they can invest to, right. to, to protect themselves. And the people with greater need are the people who don't have access to those funds or resources to do that. So, right. so um, uh, Patrick um, Bohan? With Bohan. Uh, Bohan? Yeah. yeah. Public housing? I mean, that's one reason I have him kind of, for, for that reason, because he's, his interest is those houses that are just above community actions income eligibility, which means that they don't have any kind of special assistance already available to them. Um, so I don't know if I don't know I don't know Peter well enough if he could help us identify that kind of a person you're talking about, at least. I think the neighborhood connections that you talked about, I think yeah. those are really key because I'm thinking yeah. about even the neighborhood that I live in. We have, you know, there are like four houses off the top of my head. I'm thinking of with folks who. Um, really could benefit from something like this, but really won't go online and won't, you know, right. all of that kind of stuff. 
but it's you know the lead civic association that knows who those households right. are and can kind of refer them. And right. So I think it's really you know thinking in those ways of the person-to-person -person contact as well as all the technology around how we do the outreach. Right. Right. That's that's what come I think this model of outreach um, lends itself to that kind of a thing because you know there's a certain assumption we're having here that it means your income uh, means that you'll understand this or not, and that's not true. You know. Your income limits maybe what you can do, um, unless there's state programs, but you could have someone with quite an income that has no idea how to, <laughs> how to navigate this or take advantage of this. I think part of the value proposition here is that these are gonna be fixed pricing, right? Like we're negotiating with contractors for single head unit, these three options is gonna be 15% you know, below the normal price or whatever. Yeah, that's the way other programs have run. Yeah. yeah, So, and that's a solarized model. I mean, they, right. they, you reach a certain volume and you get this price per kilowatt. Right, right, it's, right. So that's, that's the whole thing that's all about here. So for folks in, you know, that you're talking about in this community, I think that there's a lot of uh, opportunity to bundle all the rebates ahead of time and then specific messaging is like, you know, because you fall on this income graph, or if you do, you get this additional $800 which is what the Mass Community Center offers. Um, so they're not getting the generic messaging, but really specific. And they're, because the rebates are based on uh, income, the messaging should, as much as possible, because the value proposition will be much greater, mm -hmm. right? That's another 30% mm -hmm. off of the, the technology. Right, it'll take an effort to make a very clear table that people can understand. Yeah. That's <laughs> so all. Right. You also have an age demographic that's not necessarily, uh, does not access as online materials with the same facility as other folks do. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole, there's, uh, there's people on fixed incomes who are seniors um, who might not, that the only way you would get this information to them is either by door to door right. or through the senior center possibly. Um, so. It, there are a number of avenues in this particular, there's groups that would, we can capture that wouldn't otherwise consider these things perhaps given if we did everything No, I, I, straightforward. Yeah, I agree with you, Bill, and I'm gonna to add to that, that you know, one of the benefits that you know, policy-wise uh, we have to look at, and it's, it's probably worthwhile, is that do you approach people without air conditioning to put these in, particularly elderly? because then they'll have a cooling capacity. And that is some, that'll help us resilience. They'll be and you're like pitching in the summer. The, the, heat, the heat pumps. That I mean, you'll be, the you'll heat, be, uh, be heat pitching waste. in the summer, you can say you can dehumidify and cool down your house. Right. Uh, much cheaper than putting in central air conditioning mm -hmm. or window units. Right, and uh, maybe not the whole house, but at least the portions of your house. Well, portion of your house could be yeah. cool. And you're probably going to save more in the summer I mean, save more in the winter on heating costs than you're going to add in the summer on cooling costs. Um, so, uh, so you know, that, that is kind of a policy, policy decision that I, I could see North Hampton kind of pushing people who don't have air conditioning, particularly elderly, um, to take advantage of this. We're targeting just owners, right? Homeowners? We are talking about homeowners. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it could be landlords, too, but it's going to have to be, it's going to, have to be someone who has control of putting something in a building. Yeah. So I'm gonna wrap it up, that's the status. Uh, we have Carol uh, and Collins here. Thank you, Carol, for coming down. Carol, um, yeah, if you, feel, if you feel like standing at the podium, that's, that'll work. Um, um, I actually did bring a handout, and uh, thank you for having me, Chris. Well, thank you for coming down. Because I didn't make enough copies, so I'm hoping we can share. share. We share. And then I can get you one. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And um, just a little, in, little introduction, uh, you know, the Energy Commission at one point looked at uh, electric aggregation when the Hampshire Council of Governments was, um, well, was pushing it. Uh, as you guys recall, your first response was, uh, you know, reducing electricity prices is, is, you know, a good social goal to have, but it's not, it's, it's, it's not what this commission is about. So why are we talking to you? And then we talked to the Hampshire Council of Governments and came up with that if we could have some of the savings directed towards renewable energy funds, some way to increase the green of Northampton, that we would be interested 
after council governors agreed with us, went off and tried to do it. The whole thing fell apart. And but I know that Carol uh, in Greenfield, they um, the entire community buys 100% green, and 21% of that is the high value uh, class one green from local sources. And I said, well, there's a model that's getting at what we were looking at before. So that's why I asked Carol. So it's great to be here, and uh, you know, I, I think uh, municipal aggregation is uh, something I never heard of before I started working in Greenfield. And you know, we we kind of uh, started this process about five years ago, and at the time it wasn't really um, outside of Cape Light Compact that some of you may be familiar with. There were really it wasn't really being used by communities as a tool to kind of for, uh, push forward a, a sustainability agenda. So. That was really what attracted me to, to doing it for Greenfield, and the mayor was very interested in the other benefits that come through giving community members choice, having some more predictability, being able to do longer terms, and um, and actually cost savings is one of the things that that is everywhere in big bold letters. Like, don't really, it's not it's not really a vehicle to, to reduce costs. If you can, great. Um, our goal is to remain competitive with the utility price. And um, you know, it's it's a nerve-wracking business of going out to the market and hoping, you know, I don't need to go to the casino anymore because I get all of my gambling like risk stuff out every time we go out to bid. But um, it's a really great uh, you know, it's 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 been I didn't really see it going into it, but, but since we've been running and we just started our third year of offering 100% green electricity to the community, we're currently quite a bit below we have ever source. So that's awesome. And to be able to just say that we're bringing, you know, we're offsetting this traditional mix and really being able to use something that everyone has to pay their electric bill, typically you really don't have any choice unless you go out and seek it and pay a premium, we're bringing it to everyone and actually, in this case, now we're saving them money. So it's it's a, it's something that I think has uh, really brought a lot of pride to the community. Um, people are very um, grateful. You know, we get a lot of positive feedback, which, as any of you know who work for the town, that's always like unexpected and very appreciated. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I, I'm not sure exactly how in depth you want me to get, but I just uh, so. Basically, when we started this process, no one else was really doing it. We kind of went to, you have to go through it. It's a very regulated process. And that handout is still kind of a work in progress, but gives you the kind of nuts and bolts. Um, it's a little dull still. It still needs to be tweaked. But it gives you, gives you what you need to know, I guess. But um, so you have to go first through the DOER to get their uh, sign off. And when we initially, well, first of all, I'll back up and say that we went out to bid, and my goal was really to, to use it as a vehicle to, to implement some green electricity um, into the community. And we were very lucky to partner with um, Peregrine Energy Group out of Boston. And they were ready. We were on this ride together. It was a very bumpy ride. <laughs> it took us a very long time to get our approval. But that's because we were kind of forging a path. Now it's great. When when we started, there were a handful of communities, and no one was really doing bringing green. It was an optional product. If it was anything at all, you had very few subscribers. There was a price premium. So now there's, as of today, when I checked, over a hundred aggregations, and we're seeing it's being used in many different ways to bring class one recs to the community. It's really putting people's money where their beliefs are and being able to say we have control now. We can choose to buy green electricity for everyone. And it's also great because, as we were talking about before, um, making it available to everyone. I always think it's a huge win when you can bring something to everyone. And it's and we're actually saving the money. So um, it's just a, a wonderful tool that, that uh, I think you know it's great that it's available to all communities, and we're seeing more communities kind of work with ways to bring green electricity. And um, so we've chosen to do it in, a, and actually, it's something that I, I feel like it's uh, as more people 
come online and it gets a little more um, tweaked, there, there's um, more opportunity to pursue um, further goals. So back to when we first started, when we were working with Peregrine, our initial plan was that we were hoping to have a fund that we could start that would be based on, it's called a mill, but it's like a tenth of a cent off of every kilowatt hour sold that would go into an energy efficiency fund that the town could use for renewable energy or energy efficiency projects. And what we wanted to do was make, you know, um, help, you know, sort of like bringing some type of efficiency upgrade to everyone or income eligible people. And we actually had to take that out of our plan. We couldn't do it. At the time, it was just, um, they didn't realize how great it was. I told them, but they didn't. Was, it, so was it DPU that? It was actually that? DOER. We wow. couldn't get there. DOER said no. Yeah. And I wouldn't let them say no without admitting that it was a great idea. So they did that, but we still had to take it out. And now you can do it. So we actually still haven't introduced that again, but other communities that are moving forward now are um, including that, and you can use it for, it has to be related to energy efficiency, but for a town, you know, city the size of Northampton, that can be, I would guess, you know, roughly 100,000 a year, if not more. Similar to your Green Up program that you had way back. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's great that that's available again and, and uh, so we're working on how to introduce that and, and we have to file an amendment but um, you know the other thing is we have what's required by the state that every electricity supplier needs to purchase and it changes every year the renewable portfolio standard last year it was 21.2 percent it needs to come from a variety of renewable energy sources so our goal, I always say Western Mass is kind of the redheaded stepchild of Massachusetts. We kind of get left behind and forgotten. And, um, and there was a glut of wrecks in the market. So we pioneered having, at the time our supplier was Con Edison, uh, we made a broker deal that they would purchase all of their wrecks required for the renewable portfolio standard from local and regional projects. So we're guaranteeing an income stream for all of the projects in town. That's so, 100% of your ex or the 21? The of the 21%. One, of the 21%. Yep. Okay. Yep. yep. And, um, and what's great is we did our solar challenge. We did our, an independent program from the Solarize, but based on the same. So a lot of the people that were able to, to install solar as part of that are now also being able to sell their recs and it goes towards our own um, municipal aggregation. So again, it's just kind of this great, I, I sort of see it as a tightening of just trying to keep our dollars local <coughs> trying to, you know, we really, our goal is to be as energy independent as we can and clean energy, and, and so these are all steps to kind of get us in that direction. Um, I don't know if, I probably have taken up close to the time, I don't know if you yeah, want to. I'd love to open it up for questions. Sure. Yeah. 100% green energy, is that, what does that include? What, where does energy come from? So. Standard offer. The standard offer this year is coming from National Wind, so they're newer. I feel like I could do a Sean Spicer review. Yes. <laughs> 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 but um, uh, yeah, so National Wind, so it's outside of New England, but they're newer projects, so they're actually eligible. We're now becoming a green power partner. They're Green E certified, and they're also um, EPA acknowledges them, so they're not older projects. That, um, but they are cheap. They're not the class ones from Massachusetts. That's what our, the optional product that you see there, That's the greener the options, Mass. that includes, and it, it re displaces 20% of the national wind with Massachusetts. And what's the class small one. premium? How much more are people paying? More? It's only half of any kilowatt hour. Kilowatt. Yeah. Cool. So it's still less than the ever source rate. Oh. But that's that's a coup right now. It, you know, it varies. Um, so, if everybody knows that they're, they're getting 100% uh, renewable energy through the electric bill, how is that affecting people's perceptions? Are they kind of saying, hey, I've got renewable energy, I can do anything I want, mm -hmm. or, uh, you know, I've, I've got clean energy, I can, I can use it however I want now because I'm not polluting anymore, or, or is it more that I'm kind of proud, I'm renewable energy, and I'm going to do more? Any well, I prefer to go or with the latter. Or is it just blank? The former you know? don't come it's into my office. It's still electricity, 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 <laughs> electricity, and I'll, you know. Yeah. Um, well, not to cut you off, sorry, but yeah. most people, anyway, the feedback I've gotten is incredibly positive, and people, 
And even, you know, so, so like I said, we try to remain competitive. And when we kicked off, it was January 2015, which probably no one remembers because, oh my god, but it was like the worst electricity ever, and the rates just spiked. Oh, yes. spiked. And yes. we, we did, oh, it was brutal. So for the first six months, we were beating Eversource, but then we were above them. So you really couldn't hang it on um, the price anymore. Or, you, you know, you could, but, but you know, we recognize and there's no fee for people to change, and I'm very aware that for some people, it, it is a huge difference if you're getting, you know, especially if you heat with electricity and it's the dead of winter and you're paying a $200, $300 bill. So, but overwhelmingly, people said, I'm really glad you're doing this and I want to stay. And I, I'm, I don't care what the price is. You know, mm -hmm. that, that, you know, even if I'm paying a little bit more, I'm really um, happy that, that my town's doing this. So, like I said, with the pride thing, I really, it, it's been shocking to me how much people have just been, and, and people just, I don't know if this, maybe this happens to you all the time, not for me, but call up and just say thank you for doing this. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> you know, I'm happy to, but it's, um, it, it really seems to have, and then of course, once we get our hooks into them, we're like, oh, you gotta call Mass Save, and you gotta do this, and then you go get, you know, so we try to, gauge the interest and, and point them in the right direction, but most people are, I think, you know, eager to take advantage of anything if they haven't already. Those times when the electricity prices spike, though, it's not just renewables that are spiking. They would have paid more with Eversource as right. well, right? I still don't understand how the whole market works, but it's basically the market is the market. Right. So, yes, every, everything went up track. and went crazy, and so, but our bills, it, they, there's a longer story to it. When, when we first rolled out, Eversource decided, they, or there was an error, that uh, everyone was charged the highest rate possible. So their rates went from like eight cents to I think it was 21 cents per kilowatt hour, and that didn't include the delivery. That was just their supply. Wow. Yeah, in January. So it was an error. It was supposed to go up to like 13 cents. That was our rate, and then their rate was like 14 or 15. You could change their name to errors. <laughs> um, the good news again we took all the lumps so you don't have to that's called a clawback provision what they did that's now not allowed so um, it was fierce though my phone did not stop ringing and I'm not joking for like two months so when we rolled out with this one I'm like I'm already planning my vacation I'm not going to be here <laughs> I am not going through that again but um, so it was a very rough start to it and, and but um Yes, ultimately, we're, we're riding the same wave. That wasn't the commodity price that spiked. It was Eversource's distribution right. charge that spiked? No, it was a supply charge. It's supply and delivery are the two uh, buckets that supposedly, it's usually a 50-50 mix. That 50% of your bill is for the electricity supply, and that's what you can deal with with municipal aggregation. Right. Any municipality can provide the, the supply. The delivery, though, still comes from every okay, source. Sorry, I'm confused. So if you had already gone to an aggregated supplier, yeah. why did that spike? Well, because um, all the billing still comes through Eversource, no matter who your supplier is. Right. And it was called a clawback provision. And so we had this contract. Everyone was supposed to start in January with their meter rebates, even though you s this is getting really into the weeds. So I'm going to try to. But anyway, they, they were able to do it at the time. No, no, not anymore. <laughs> I could talk to you more about it if you want to. But there's a variable rate. Okay, how we, we can go, you know that there's a fixed rate and there's a variable rate. So they put everyone to the variable rate because they consider if you switch not on um, a meter rebate that they can charge you that variable rate, which in January is always the highest. Yes. Um, uh, so, because you are now basically the supply, an, an electricity supplier, um, actually, is, the city is the electricity supplier, is the way it works. Does that give you any in on putting inserts and stuff in the bills? No, everything, so. <laughs> I don't know, you don't know. I know. That's, that's the thing. <laughs> I, can't, I still haven't been able to get any inserts in any bills ever in six okay. years of trying. Okay. I'm not sure if it's worth it or not, but uh, yeah. you know, most people just toss them. But. 
Well, with all the campaigns you're, you know, we're right. picking up, it's a good question. Yeah. Right, right. Um, actually, everything stays the same for the customer. They still get their bill like they always do. So they still get their bill from National Grid, and the only thing that would change is uh, there's a line that supplies. says, like, your supplier is, or, or something. And so we have no control, no, no uh, impact there. Is there any demand response component with time of use pricing or anything, or is it just that what you talked about before, you know, that fixed a variable and it's just to incent people to use less? Um, as far as if you offer time of use pricing, I just was curious yeah, we're not, we're not, not oh, that yeah. level. <laughs> yeah, that's way too sophisticated <laughs> for us. Um, I know that's you know proposed coming down the pike, but uh, no, we're we're just it's a the basic offer. And that, or, or you know, the optional product, but that's it for now. Yeah. So as part of this, don't you get access to the uh, energy efficiency surcharges on people's bills? No. That was because that was one of the benefits to when uh, each cog was there. It shouldn't have been. No, it should have been right because you can you can aggregate supply, um, but if you want to, like what uh, the Cape Light Compact down with the, with the Cape, what they did was they actually took over the efficiency programs as well, mm -hmm. yeah. which is uh, a, the second thing, something that, that they did it before Mass A was really up and running, and so they wanted to run their own programs, um, and they did okay. that. But, but so you're still kind of leveraging Mass A in your community? And yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. And just a, uh, a note, there's two, compo uh, it's one, chapter 134A and B related to municipal aggregation. A is just the supply. And that's pretty much what everyone has done except for Cape Light Compact. Okay. They did A and B. So they basically function as the complete utility. They have to purchase all the lines, all the poles. They have to provide all the services. If, it, if a line goes down, they have to fix it. If the power goes out there. So that's a big so they responsibility. Like municipal, like Holyoke or something. Exactly. Much, yeah. They have to submit plans to DPU. So you're playing with the, you know, the big guys and for a town of Greenfield size yeah. to the mayor wanted to do that, but um, you know, it's there. There are some benefits, but it's it's a big road to hill. One of the benefits is you control all the poles and the line systems. You can put in municipal broadband. You can put. Well, in we're doing that now. Yeah, exactly. yeah, we own the poles. We just don't own the right. lines. But uh, and the other thing, the thing that what I you know clicked on for me is you don't have to wait for interconnection. So I was like that right there. I was totally against it, and then I was like, okay, we can do it now, but it's a lot of money and time. Carol, do you administer this program? I do. How much time does it take? When they don't mess up the bills? Um, it's, it's very little now. Like I said, we've just started our third year. So uh, typically, the, the biggest time consumer is just getting the word out once we secure our new rate, getting the press out, and then uh, kind of shepherding people through when the first bills come through where they'll call up and be like, I don't see it yet. Um, uh, so I would say through January, January, February, it was a lot, maybe 10 hours a week mm -hmm. on average, probably a little less. And do you read the, the source, the supply? Uh, we do it once a year and typically the fall is the best. So we have a broker we work with, there's no way I would be able to do that. Okay. They go to ISO and we have an RFP that states how we want the composition, we want green up to 100%. And, um, so that's a bit of a spike in your activity. That actually is really easy. Yeah. Yeah. Nerve wracking, but easy. Mm. A couple hours. <laughs> yeah. so we have to wait for the Watch phone. The and then, <laughs> it's, it's, then it's like, you have to sign this and get it back to us within two hours. Or, you know, yeah. I mean, you're dealing with the, it's like Wall Street, it's crazy market stuff. And Customers that are currently buying green power, the, the uh, energy, the uh, green start, or, um, do they have to cancel that? Anyone who is not with, in our case, Eversource, stays with whoever they have their contract with. Okay. So we call those third party suppliers. Anyone who's with a third party supplier or competitive supplier stays there. Anyone who's with us would get switched over, or you know, would have been switched over. Um, unless they choose to opt out. And then at any time, they can join or leave. So a current Green Start customer wouldn't have to opt out by Green Start to get Is Green Start through National Grid? We don't yeah. have anything like yeah, that yeah, with every yeah, source. Yeah, you okay. have to go through, go find it on your own. Okay. 
Do you have a sense of what percent of potential customers you're getting? I, I on my way down, I was like, oh, I wish I had those numbers. Well, like with Cape Light Compact, I think they maintain it's like ninety four percent. I think we're somewhere, maybe a little below that, like ninety one percent. But uh, I haven't checked recently. What was your question? What percent of people have to the city now. versus opting out? And again, okay. because when you start this, it's an opt out. Basically, everyone's in who's on the basic supply unless they choose to opt out. So you start off, you can you pretty much be uh, guaranteed you're going to start off with 95 percentage or so. But since three years ago, there's been a lot of third party suppliers yep. getting the pavement. Yep. That's my new uh, battle. I've been uh, trying to work with the AG's office and also the DPU because, at least in Greenfield, and I know there's some here. But I don't know if it has to dovetail with our aggregation. There, are, it's unbelievably aggressive, yeah. and they're very um, unethical and and trying to. Some of them are, yeah. Yeah, some of them are. So. Um, they come in at a low rate, and then three months later it spikes. Well, there's that. Just then there's marketing. people that just tell you they're the, ever, you know, they're the utility oh, company. Yeah. Oh, you you overpaid. We 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 need to get you your refund. You need to give us your account number so you can get your refund. Um, and, and they tend to prey a lot on, on elderly people. And so that's been another, you know, when you asked about time, I actually spent a fair amount of time just trying to help people <coughs> that learn by learning more about this, that they've been overcharged for years. They don't even remember switching, but they're on some third party supplier and paying like 18 cents a kilowatt hour mm -hmm. for supply. And, uh, <coughs> and then, you know, trying to figure out how to get off of it. Mm -hmm. But are you asking about, uh, I mean, there's other no, just companies things that have changed since three years ago. Yeah. There's a lot more yeah. third parties, so maybe that yeah. if, if we launch tonight, that maybe 15% people will already be on a third party supplier. Yeah, it actually wasn't that high. And even with our greener option, it's funny because they don't know I know the numbers. But, you know, everyone's like, oh, I'll do that. It's less than, a, you know, we have three people on it. So that was the other thing when we talked to um, provide, you know, brokers when we first started this. On? Three people on the greener option. So um, That's it? Yep. Yep. And it's because then people have to sign up or, you know, maybe they need to, but they don't, whatever. Whenever they have to act, it, you know. Hope one of them's the mayor. I'm sorry? <laughs> Hope one of them's the mayor. Yeah. Hope one of them's the mayor. There's a few other people. Yeah. <laughs> she lives in I actually live here. <laughs> so, um, you guys are really green. You just switch jobs. Yeah. I know. Chris can be from Monica. Save some travel time. Right? You can yeah. wave to each other on the way from the I know. I thought it. We swap cars. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're about out of time. Um, any last minute? Any last questions? No, I just, uh, this is enormously appealing. I, it's, I, I think it, it does. As Carol said, it's actually it's a perfect time for everything else that we're doing. We um, capitalize on a, on a kind of a community groundswell of interest in in becoming the greenest possible community we can be. It also ties in with all the resolutions that we're just passing. It ties in, you know, it's, it's there is there is an awareness, and certainly, and as Chris had mentioned before, since the election, for some reason, people have a keener awareness or a keener interest in trying to do whatever they can for autonomy and also for uh, becoming more green. It, it really does, <coughs> it sounds like we're at a nice time here. That's the only way I can describe it, I suppose, with the, uh, to take advantage of something like this. Is, I mean, we were very excited about the HCOG, of course, and, right. we, and, and, and probably they were more crushed than we were when, when they got the thumbs down, but the prospect here, and I, and I like it, it's a lot more streamlined. So as you said, you've already, you've already cut the brush, cleared the path, yeah. so it's... Thanks, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, I have one more time. Have you, have you helped any other communities on Rebecca County go this way? So with aggregation, each community has to do it independently. So we've right. been talking, I've shared the information with a lot of communities. That's actually, this one paper is going to become just like a handout to try to educate people, basically. But I've talked to other towns, other um, committees, uh, you know, especially with a lot of the smaller communities, they're not as appealing to, to brokers, right. to, to um, you know. Um, 
join in. So we can all work together, but we, I guess we're trying to figure that out. Okay. But we are definitely helping to, you know, trying to shepherd anyone who wants to move on. And anyone who did do the HCOG, the first step is you have to take a municipal vote to, I that, I think you said an MLP actually. Right? Yeah, if, if you was, it, well, wait a minute, no, there, was, there was something with an MLP, but it wasn't our, I don't think we had to have an MLP. No, we, no, that's for the MBA but, stuff, but this is a, uh, it actually says on the back. <laughs> I think it's just take a vote to pursue the aggregation. That's right. So I believe that the votes that all the communities took to participate with each card are still valid. Oh, okay. Um, <coughs> and then we have a plan that we can, you know, use as a template. And uh, actually, Peregrine is, is, I can't say enough good words about them and what we had to go through and they were with us. Like, there's no way we could have done it without them. But what I will say is that if you do choose to move forward now, the process is taking a lot less. We're saying nine months, but it can be a lot less than that. And you can also include this um, energy efficiency fund. And there was one other point I wanted to make, but I don't remember. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> I asked my question, I drove your last point out of your mind. No, that's okay. But it was just more about, um, you know, I'm happy to answer any questions. Chris has my contact information. Yep. But, um, I can't, again, I I called it municipal aggravation for quite a while. <laughs> <laughs> that was the bit. And, but now, it, I can't imagine not doing this. I think it's such a great um, product to bring to the town. And just, again, seeing the reaction, it's it's uh, it's just great to be able to do something that has an impact on the whole community. That doesn't cost any, you know, it's all free stuff. But, oh, yeah, anyway, same thing with the, Implementing all the local recs. You gotta do it so I can sell my recs. <laughs> <laughs> but. Thank you very much, Carol. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, be before we break up, I actually do have uh, questions for the two more, kind of two more questions for the commission. Should we put electric aggregation on the next agenda or a future agenda? I, I would like that on um, at, at least a future agenda. Okay. The next yeah. one, if, you, if you've got a shallow agenda, sure. Yep, okay. And the other one I was going to ask was um, uh, Climate Action Now is Sunshot program. They were looking for a city to partner. Um, I'm not sure that's a conversation to have with city staff, or should we bring it up with the Energy Commission and um, uh, discuss that further? I don't, I don't know. Could that, I mean, I'm not sure if the commission is a place to talk about it further. But you would request city cooperation I wanted to give the commission a chance to say put it on another agenda. It, well that might be just the time to be the you know, city staff to talk about Well we're an advisory committee. And yeah. I mean if the staff is on board with it then they don't need our advice. Okay, okay. So I I won't put that on the future agenda. Yeah. It's more like I had to help with the city staff I don't that. Okay. That's it. I move that we adjourn. Oh there we go. All in favor.